Today our topic is the dielectric covered ground plane. And as the name suggests, this is a structure in which we have a ground plane, which would be a perfect, ideally anyway, a perfect electrical conductor, which is grounded. So this is a PEC. And then it's covered with a dielectric. Looks something like this. We will take the vertical axis here, be the y axis, this will be the x axis, and then we'll have the z axis coming out of the board. Z out of the board, here's x and here's y. Up above the dielectric, we have free space, mu zero, epsilon zero. And down below, we have a non magnetic dielectric, mu zero, epsilon zero times epsilon relative. The height of the dielectric is h. And we want to see what kinds of fields can propagate in this structure, and in particular, can be guided. Uh, and that specifically means we want fields such that the integral from zero to infinity, the magnitude of e squared dy is finite. Even though this structure, the free space part, is unbounded, it goes off to y is equal to infinity, we want there to be a finite amount of field energy in that uh, domain of zero to infinity in the, along the y-axis. And so this is going to preclude solutions that would have, say, behavior e to the minus j beta y y, because if we took that, and took the magnitude squared integral from zero to infinity of that, that of course would go to infinity, the integral of one from zero to infinity. Likewise, if instead we took the other types of solutions we've been using, things like the sine or the cosine, beta y y squared dy, that also goes to infinity. Instead, we're going to need a behavior that is exponentially decaying. And we can get that if our beta y has the form of an imaginary number minus j alpha y. Is then e to the minus j beta y y becomes e minus j times minus j is minus 1. And so you get minus alpha y y and of course the integral from zero to infinity of e to the minus alpha y y dy is finite assuming that uh, alpha y is a positive real number now why are we interested in this kind of structure Well, one, one reason is illustrated here in this figure, uh, which shows a microstrip circuit. So on the this is the back side of the circuit. This is a ground plane. Here it's connected to two SMA male connectors, which then can be connected to uh, transmission lines, coaxial cables. And then you see on the other side, on the top side, this is the dielectric here, and then you have these traces running in this in this case this is a, a filter microwave filter um, now the problem of dealing with this kind of a circuit where you have traces on top of the dielectric is called the microstrip problem and that's more difficult than the problem we're going to deal with today which is just this ground plane and the dielectric okay so it's a extension of what we're going to be looking at today so th these are extremely important types of circuits in radio frequency engineering. In addition, there can be other kinds of structures that have this property, uh, or at least can be modeled by this sort of a, a, a geometry with a ground plane with a dielectric on top of it. 
So this is an important practical problem. So how are we going to get these exponentially decaying fields? Well, remember that whether we use e to the plus or minus j, beta y, y, uh, or solutions of the form cosine beta y y or sine beta y y, any of these types of solutions, the constant beta y along with the corresponding beta x and beta z values have to satisfy beta x squared plus beta y squared plus beta z squared is equal to beta squared. Right, where beta squared is omega squared mu epsilon. Now, in writing this out, when we did our separation of variables solution of the Helmholtz equation in rectangular coordinates, we never put any constraints on the beta x, y, or z values. They are arbitrary complex values. We said in most applications they'll be real, but they don't have to be. Well, okay. So we could have beta y be minus j alpha y, and then we could put this into this uh, equation here, and what we would have would be that beta x squared plus, let's jump to beta z squared, and then beta y squared, as we've seen before, would be minus alpha y squared is equal to beta squared. So that would be our equation then for, to have a solution of the Helmholtz equation. So that's perfectly perfectly valid. Now, to simplify our analysis, we're going to assume no x dependence. And as you, we go through this uh, solution, you'll see how things would have changed if we had included an x dependence. There'd just be more bookkeeping. But we, to simplify our analytic work, we're going to assume no x dependence. So we only have y and z dependence of the field. So if we have no x dependence, then that would mean that the beta x would vanish. Okay. So with that, what are we going to have? Well, let's see. Now, we don't need to have an exponentially decaying field down here in the dielectric because that's a finite um, domain in the, along the y-axis. It's just from 0 to h. So it's really only in the air or the free space that we need to have the exponentially decaying field. So we'll assume that in the dielectric, the corresponding equation here, is going to be, we'll write it this way, beta z squared plus beta y squared will be equal to beta squared, which is omega squared mu zero, epsilon zero, epsilon relative. That's in the dielectric. All right, so that's for y between zero and h. And then it's only in the region above the dielectric to free space interface here at y is equal to h that we need to have this exponentially decaying type of field. And so in that region, we'll then have beta z squared minus alpha y squared is equal to beta zero squared, where beta zero squared is omega squared mu zero epsilon zero. So this is from h to infinity. So notice that beta squared is just epsilon relative times beta zero squared. Okay, so we're going to look first at TMZ modes. And we're going into, this is a, the case where we would have a vector of magnetic potential which has only a z component. And as we said, there is no x dependence, we're assuming, so this will only depend on y 
and z. And we do want fields that propagate in the z direction, that is, that would be propagating out of the board in this picture. And so with that, we'll take, have our az have the form uh, in the free space region, some constant a0, e to the minus alpha y y, and then propagating along the z-axis, we'll have e to the minus j beta z z. And again, that's y greater than h. And then down in the dielectric, a constant ad. And we'll use sines and cosines there. Right. We can use either combinations of e to the plus or minus j beta y y or sine of beta y y and cosine of beta y y. And we could have used, put down here, an arbitrary linear combination of sine and cosine, but as we'll see, for our boundary conditions at the PEC, we'll need to have the sine behavior. So we'll, we'll just jump ahead with that result and just build it into our solution right now. We've already seen how you would go through the process of figuring out whether you use the sine or the cosine. Okay, and then, so this is for the region y between 0 and h. Now, uh, it, we could, obviously, one solution would be the trivial solution where the fields vanish, and then in that case, a0 and d0 would be 0. In the non-trivial solution, we could fix one of these constants, say we fix the AD constant, then there's going to be some relation between A0 and that AD, right? And that will be, they'll, they'll, that'll then fix the amplitude of the field up above the dielectric interface. So this is going to be constrained now by the boundary conditions. This is our, our general solution that has the exponentially decaying behavior along the y-axis up in the free space region. And our boundary conditions now are what? Well, at the PEC surface, the tangential electric field components have to vanish. That would be the EX and coming out of the board, the EZ. Those would have to vanish at uh, Y is equal to zero. So there's boundary conditions. R at y is equal to 0, ex is equal to ez is equal to 0. All right, now let's, uh, let's impose this. First, we need to figure out what ex and ez are. And if we go to our vector uh, magnetic potential um, results in the vector potential lecture where we have an az component and we derive from that ex, ey, ez, hx, and hy, uh, we find that the only non-zero components are the two, which are ey, which is 1 over j omega mu epsilon, the second derivative with respect to y and z of az, the EX has a second derivative with respect to X and Z, and of course there's no X dependence, so any derivative with respect to X would vanish. That's why there's no EX. And then EZ is minus one over J omega mu epsilon, the second derivative with respect to Y of AZ. Okay, very good. So EY is not tangential to the surface. It po it's normal, right? It points in the upward direction. So that does not have to vanish. The only thing that has to vanish is EZ. Second derivative with respect to Y. Well, the Y dependence comes through the sine factor. And so the derivative of the sine is the cosine. The derivative of the cosine is minus the sine. 
and and then you'd get two uh, chain rule factors of beta y. So you'd get minus beta y squared times sine beta y y. And of course, then this is, so this is proportional to sine beta y y. And of course, that equals zero. At y is equal to zero. So that boundary condition is already built into our solution. So that's, if we'd use the cosine, of course, then we would get trying to impose that the cosine of beta y y is equal to zero at y is equal to zero which would not be true very well now what about at y is equal to h at the interface between the dielectric and air well there we need to have the continuity of the tangential components which would be the the x and z components so we would need to have EX, EZ, HX, and HZ are continuous at Y is equal to H. Well, we've already seen that uh, EX is zero, so we don't have to worry about that. But we do have to have continuity of EZ. Okay, so what is that going to give us? Well, here is our expression for, for AZ. And uh, EZ is minus 1 over J omega mu epsilon, second derivative with respect to Y. So let's work out what that is. Um, EZ is up in the free space region. Second derivative with respect to y would bring down two factors, chain rule factors of minus alpha y. So minus alpha y squared would just be alpha y. So we would just add in an alpha y here, along with our <clears throat> minus 1 over j omega, and it would be mu 0 epsilon 0 up in the free space region. So we would get minus a0 alpha y squared over j omega mu 0 epsilon 0 e to the minus alpha y y and e to the minus j beta z z. Again, this is above the interface, y greater than, than h. And then down in the dielectric, um, <clears throat> we'd have a second derivative with respect to y. So as we said before, that would bring out two chain rule factors of beta y. So we get beta y squared and then a minus sine. Okay, so... Now, that minus for the minus sign will cancel this minus in the minus 1 over j omega mu epsilon. And so what we have down in the dielectric is AD beta y squared over j omega mu 0 and then epsilon times the sine beta y y e to the minus j beta z z. And that's for y between 0 and h. So this has to be con these expressions have to be continuous at y is equal to h. So we set them equal to each other. Now we can cancel common factors. They both have the z propagation factor e to the minus j beta z z. We'll cancel that. They have a common j omega mu 0 uh, factor. So we'll cancel that, and that leaves then for in the upper region minus a0 over epsilon 0 alpha y squared e to the minus alpha y, and this is at y is equal to h. So down in the dielectric, <clears throat> doing the same process, we would have ad over epsilon beta y squared sine beta y and y is equal to h. So there's our first equation. Now because how many, how many unknowns do we have? Go back up to our original az expression. Well, we've got these, these two amplitudes, a0 and ad, and then we've got these two 
uh, the propagation factor beta z and this exponential decay factor alpha y. It looks like we have four unknowns, but as we said previously, we can fix one of these amplitudes arbitrarily, and then the then we only have the other amplitude that would be determined in terms of that. So we really have three unknowns. Say if we fix AD, then we have A0, alpha Y, and beta Z. So this would be our first equation in hopefully um, of three equations in three unknowns. Now, uh, it's convenient when we're doing numerical solutions to try to have only dimensionless variables that we're dealing with. And we can get that here if we notice that the, the alpha y has units of inverse meters as well as beta y does. So alpha y h is dimensionless and beta y h is dimensionless. So let's take this whole expression and multiply by h squared. And then let's also do the following. Uh, let's multiply through by epsilon, and then we'll have on the left epsilon over epsilon zero, which is epsilon relative. And let's also divide by AD. Then what we're gonna have is on the left, we'll have minus epsilon relative, A zero over AD, alpha Y times H quantity squared, that's from bringing the H squared in here, and then E to the minus alpha y h is equal to, and on the right, we'll just have the beta y times h quantity squared, and the sine beta y times h. Okay, let's name our new dimensionless quantities, the alpha y h and beta y h. Let's give them the following names. We're going to define u is going to be beta y h, w is alpha y h, and a, with no subscript, is the ratio of a0 to a d. So with that, this equation becomes minus epsilon relative a w squared e to the minus w is equal to u squared sine of u. There's one equation in dimensionless uh, variables, right? Because whatever the units of a0 and ad are, the ratio is going to be dimensionless. And then, as we said, u and w are dimensionless. Okay, so we've dealt with the electric field now. We have uh, have built into our solution with the sine factor that it vanishes at y is equal to zero, and then we just come up, have come up with an equation that makes EZ be continuous at y is equal to h. Now we have an addition. At y is equal to h, we need to have um, hx and hz must be continuous. Again, hy would be normal to the surface. Now this is a TMZ mode, so that means that HC is equal to zero. So there is no HC, so we only have to worry then about HX. So the expression for HX is that it's equal to one over mu, the Y derivative of AZ. And by the way, there is no HY. because it would involve an X derivative of AZ and there's no X dependence. Okay, so we're just gonna have one over mu, which is mu zero everywhere, and Y derivative. So up here, Y derivative, that would bring down a factor of minus alpha Y. Uh, the sine would become cosine and you'd get a factor of, of beta Y. Actually, we should have gone up to this, this expression where we're gonna apply that. Okay, so we get a minus alpha Y, uh, we get cosine, and then with the beta y out, and then we divide everything by mu zero. So what we end up with then is our hx is minus 
a0 alpha y over mu0 e to the minus alpha y y e to the minus j beta zz that's for y greater than h and then down in the dielectric we've got ad beta y over mu zero cosine beta y y e to the minus j beta zz and that is between uh, for y between zero and h so that has to be continuous at y is equal to h and so that equation would be minus a zero alpha y uh, over mu zero but they both have a mu zero so let's cancel that and then e to the minus alpha y h and they both have a e to the minus j beta zz let's cancel that all right so then down in the dielectric we'd have a d beta y cosine beta y h again let's multiply in this case by h so that we'll have beta y h and alpha y h let's divide by through by a d so then this becomes minus a zero over a d alpha y h e to the minus alpha y h is equal to beta y h times cosine beta y h and then using our definitions of these dimensionless variables u w and a this becomes minus a w e to the minus w is equal to u cosine of u there's our second equation So we need a third equation. And our third equation actually is implicit in these relationships. Right, these, this is going to create a relationship between the beta y and the alpha y. So let's rewrite this by subtracting the second equation from the first. So we'll have beta squared minus beta 0 squared. Over here, we'll have beta z minus squared minus beta z squared that'll cancel out and then we'll have beta y squared minus minus alpha y squared so we're going to get the equation following equation beta squared minus beta zero squared equals beta y squared plus alpha y squared again let's make these dimensionless the betas and the alphas all have units of inverse meters. They're squared, so that's inverse meters squared. So let's multiply by h squared. And then we're going to have beta squared minus beta 0 squared times h squared. And remember that beta y h is u, so that'll be u squared. And alpha y h is w, so that'll be w squared. All right, that'll be our third equation, but we're going to manipulate it just a little bit more, really define something here. And let's make this definition that V is equal to, first of all, remember that beta squared is bigger than beta zero squared because it's beta zero squared type times epsilon relative. And therefore, this expression is positive. So it'll have a real square root. So we'll write this as the square root of beta squared minus beta zero squared times the square root of h squared, which is just h. And now let's rewrite this as, remember that beta squared is just epsilon relative times beta 0 squared. Okay, and then you've got minus 1 times h. 
So finally, this would be square root of beta zero squared would be beta zero, and then times h, and then times the square root of epsilon relative minus one. And we're going to call this, let's re rewrite that again, b is beta zero h times the square root of epsilon relative minus one. We call the normalized frequency. It's proportional to frequency because remember that beta zero is omega square root u zero epsilon zero it is proportional to frequency. And it's dimensionless because beta zero h is dimensionless, epsilon relative is dimensionless. Okay, with that, then we can write this expression, this guy here becomes v squared. We've got our third equation, which is that v squared equals u squared plus w squared. Now we have three equations in three unknowns. Okay, they're not simple equations. Uh, these these two up here include uh, exponentials and uh, trig functions, and so um, it's not going to be simple to solve. Maybe we try to whittle it down um, and combine some equations so that we can reduce the number of unknowns and the number of equations. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to start with these, these two equations here, and we're gonna, going to divide... The first one up here, let's call this equation one, and this equation two, and this equation three. So we're gonna take equation one divided by equation two. What's that gonna look like? Okay, over on the left, in both cases we have an w e to the minus w. Let's see, in the first one we've got a w squared e to the minus w, so we'll cancel w e to the minus w, just leave a a w. They both have a minus a, so that'll cancel. So we're going to, over on the left, we're just going to have w. Okay, that's all that's going to be left. On the right, what are we going to get? Uh, I'm sorry, we're also going to have the epsilon relatives. We'll have epsilon relative w. Over on the right, we're going to have u squared sine of u divided by u cosine of u. Well, that's going to be u squared over u is u, sine over cosine is the tangent. Okay, and then finally, that epsilon relative, we'll divide it and put it over on the right side, and we'll end up then with w equals 1 over epsilon relative u tangent of u. There's an equation that relates only two variables, u and w. Now, then from equation three, let's rewrite this to solve for w. So move the u squared over to the left, take the square root. So it'll be the square root of v squared minus u squared. And now we have two expressions that are equal to w. And therefore, we can put those together. And we'll write f of u is the square root of v squared minus u squared is equal to 1 over epsilon relative u tangent of u is equal to g of u. Okay, so this is, that's f of u, and this is g of u. And those two functions of u must be equal. Now, if we sketch this, and we'll make uh, f be in red. So as a function of u, once we've chosen a frequency, then v is fixed. So when u is equal to 0, this thing is equal to v. 
and <clears throat> put that right here, equal to V. And then, of course, it decreases. And when you get down to U is equal to V, then it's equal to zero. And in fact, it looks like a piece of a circle, something like, oops, I didn't do that very well. A little better. So that's, that's your F of U, it looks something like that. And how about G of U? Let's uh, do that in blue. So at U is equal to zero, zero times tangent zero is zero. Okay, so it starts at zero. And then at, uh, of course, the tangent of pi over two is infinity. So say this is pi over two here. We know at that point, it's gonna blow up to infinity. So it's gonna do something like this. That's your G of U. So F of U starts at V and it's monotonically decreasing. G of U starts at zero and it's monotonically increasing, at least for U less than pi over two. So they must have a single intersection. Now, if you go beyond pi over two, then of course the tangent is periodic and you're gonna get other branches over here, okay? But we're just gonna focus on this, this one for right now. Um, and so we're guaranteed there's gonna be a solution, but we can't analytically solve this equation. But we can do it numerically. So here we are in the Scilab console. So Scilab's kind of like an open source version of MATLAB. And uh, let's solve our problem. F of u is equal to g of u. Let's do define function. Say y equals uh, some function h of u, which is going to be the difference. F of u minus g of u. Of course, if f of u is equal to g of u, then f of u minus g of u has got to be equal to 0. So let's write that out. W is equal to the f of u is the square root of v squared. And let's say v is 0.9. So v squared minus u squared minus u times the tangent of u over epsilon relative. Let's say epsilon relative is 2. So then that would be the function that we want to find the zero of. What value of u makes this zero? And we can choose f solve. Oops, f solve. Uh, let's start at uh, 0 0.1, and we're solving the function h of u, and there's our solution, very close to 0 0.8. Uh, and this is a, because there's one solution between u is equal to 0 and u is equal to 0 0.9, this is a very robust problem. We could start at, say, 0 0.8, and we would get the same solution. Okay, so given a value of epsilon relative, and a value of the normalized frequency, v, we can very easily numerically solve for the value of u. Now, having solved f of u equals g of u for the value, some value of u here, we can then go back and uh, use either one of these equations to solve for w. Probably simplest to use this, this equation here. And then we can go back to either one of equation one or two and use that to solve for A. We'll now know U and W, and we can just solve for A from that equation. Okay, so that's our procedure for coming up with a solution. So let's see. Uh, and then we can solve, go through and solve for our uh, e, EZ. Where is that? Here's our EZ and our HX. And then the one component we haven't yet solved for is uh, EY, because remember that EY didn't play any role. Let's, let's write it in here in our boundary conditions, but it is part of the solution. So now we can go and solve for EY. So EY is 1 over J omega mu epsilon, the second derivative with respect to Y and Z of AZ. And so we apply it, apply that to 
our az expression. So we're going to take a z derivative. That's going to bring down a minus j beta z. And a y derivative in the y greater than h region will bring down a minus uh, alpha y. And in the uh, dielectric region, it will cause a sine beta y y to become cosine beta y y and bring out a factor of beta y. Okay, very well. So, with that, we end up with the following expression for EY. Uh, in the region above the dielectric interface, we've got A0, alpha Y, beta Z. Those are from the Y and the Z derivatives. The E to the minus J beta z, uh, that j cancels a j here. And then you've got over omega u0 epsilon 0, e to the minus alpha y, e to the minus j beta z, z, and that's for y greater than h. Um, and the minus sign here gets clobbered uh, because you're going to have e to the minus alpha y, oops, not, not there, sorry, here, e to the minus alpha y, e to the minus j beta z, so you're going to get minus a minus, and then the j cancels with the j in the denominator here, okay. And then down in the dielectric, you end up with minus a d beta y, beta z over omega mu zero epsilon cosine beta y y and the propagation factor in z. And that's between y between zero and h. All right, it's convenient to make a definition here of for the for the amplitude so we can kind of combine all of these these terms here into something a little more manageable let's define e max in the dielectric to be this factor here ad uh, minus sorry ad uh, beta y beta z over omega mu zero epsilon and e max in the free space region em zero to be this factor up here a zero alpha y beta z over omega mu zero epsilon zero and with that then we can write that ey is e m zero e to the minus alpha y y e to the minus j beta z z in the region above the interface in the dielectric in free space and it's e m d cosine beta y y e to the minus j beta z z in the dielectric. How about the ez? Um, where is ez up here? There we go, ez. So if you look at these these coefficients in those em these, et cetera, that we just uh, defined, there's a factor of j, and there's a factor of alpha y over beta z here, and beta y over beta z here. So we then have that ez is j alpha y 
over beta z, e m0, e to the minus alpha y, y, e to the minus j, beta z, z, for y greater than h, and j beta y over beta z, e m d, uh, and instead of the cosine, right, for the e z, we've got the sine. Beta y, y, and the propagation factor. And that's for y from zero to h. Okay, so those are our non-zero components of the electric field. And the magnetic field. Now, as we show in detail in the PDF notes, can be written as minus EM0 sorry, here we go, minus EM0 over Z0 e to the minus alpha y y e to the minus j beta z z and minus emd over zd cosine of beta y y e to the minus j beta z z or y from zero to h where this impedance z0 is beta z over omega epsilon 0 and zd is beta z over omega epsilon okay and so in that case what you see is that hx is just minus ey divided by this impedance Z, either Z0 out in free space or ZD in the dielectric. Kind of makes sense, because if you're looking here along the Z axis, this is X and this is Y, and we have some HY, then if the field is propagating in the z direction, the, I'm sorry, this is EY, EY. Okay, so this is our EY up here. Uh, and if it's propagating along the z direction, then H must, must be in the minus x hat direction so that you get the, the cross product of E and H is then the pointing vector which is probably getting along the z-axis in the z-direction. And if you work out what that is, fairly straightforward because you've got, so if you're going to do one half, the real part of E cross H, because um, EZ has J's in it, when you take the real part of that multiplied by HX, you're going to get zero. So that doesn't uh, have any influence on the pointing vector. It's just going to be the EY cross the HX here. And what you get is that the pointing vector is, is in the z direction and up in the free space region it's magnitude em0 squared over 2z0 e to the minus 2 alpha y y And there is your exponentially decaying power level so that there's a finite amount of energy along the uh, y-axis. And then down in the dielectric, it's E m d magnitude squared over 2 z d. And then the cosine squared of beta y y.
there is your, your pointing vector. Okay, so this was a fairly complicated analysis. So let's just summarize our recipe for solving this system. So you give me a frequency. I'm going to calculate the normalized frequency. V is uh, equal to omega h times the square root mu zero epsilon zero times the square root of epsilon relative minus one. Then I'm going to solve the square root of v squared minus u squared is equal to one over epsilon relative u tangent of u for the value of u. And then I'm going to calculate W is the square root of V squared minus U squared. And also, I can calculate A is minus U cosine U over W e to the minus W. Then, step four, I can calculate beta Y is U over H. Alpha y is w over h, and beta z is, if we're in the di dielectric, it would be the beta squared would be omega squared mu zero epsilon, and then that minus beta y squared would be beta z squared. Take the square root, you got your beta z. Then calculate. E M zero, which is minus A um, W epsilon relative over U um, times E M D. Okay, and so there's our there's our E M D. Or you could use the, the A and the alpha Y and the beta Z if you wanted to, to get the EM0, but you could also use that the, they're related because of the boundary conditions. And that's through the, the factor of A, which you can solve, for example, this equation to get A. That's what we're writing down here. So there's your EM0 in terms of EMD. Your Z0 value, which is beta z over omega epsilon zero and zd which is beta z over omega epsilon and then from there you can calculate the, the field components ey ez and hx and your pointing vector. So let's follow this process for the case where epsilon relative is nine, H is one centimeter, the frequency is 2.6 gigahertz, and our EMD is 100 volts. This is the maximum electric field magnitude in the dielectric, it's 100 volts per meter. And uh, here's, the, we go through this recipe, and here are the results that we get. Here is the EY value. Notice that it is discontinuous. Only the tangential components of electric and magnetic fields need to be continuous. Those are the H and Z components. The Y component, which is the normal component, can be discontinuous, and indeed it is. And in fact, what should be continuous for the normal component is the dy, which is epsilon times ey. Well, epsilon relative in this case is nine. So you can see that the, the value of ey in the dielectric, uh, at the top of the dielectric is about 20. And for the ey, it's about 
nine times that, about 180, which is just epsilon relative times uh, the value inside the, the dielectric here. So in other words, epsilon relative times 20 is very close, it is equal to the EY value when you are immediately above the interface in the air. Okay, so that has to be actually discontinuous. HX is this discontinuous, this is minus HX. And here's EZ, it's continuous. Uh, H, HX is, is continuous, but its uh, slope is discontinuous, that's okay. Likewise for EZ. And then here is the pointing vector, PZ. It's discontinuous because it's the product of EY and minus HX. And EY is discontinuous. But the important thing is notice here this exponential decay in that power. So by the time you get out, right, this is the top of the dielectric is at one centimeter. By the time we get out to about four centimeters, that field has dropped off, become almost insignificant. Now, in principle, the field, actually, in theory, the field is never zero up in the free space region. And it goes off to y is equal to infinity, but it's decaying exponentially so fast that it becomes negligible. Now we could consider T easy modes. In this case, we're going to have an electric vector potential with a Z component. It's going to look like F0 e to the minus alpha y y e to the minus j beta zz. And in the dielectric Fd, we have to use the cosine, and you can work it out so that you get the tangential component of the electric field to vanish at the PEC surface. You've got to use the cosine in this case. And you can work out the, the EX, uh, and the, in this case there is an HZ uh, and a HY component. And uh, the only distinction is if you go through and look at the uh, set of equations that you end up with, they're slightly different. We still get the, the normalized frequency, the same, same expression for that, but then our other equations look like A, W squared e to the minus W is equal to U squared uh, cosine of U. Epsilon relative A W e to the minus W is equal to U sine of U. And then b squared is u squared plus w squared. Now, we can take the ratio of these equations, and what we end up with then is 1 over epsilon relative w is equal to u cotangent of u, because you get cosine over the sine. And so then we end up solving this again for, for w, and then we end up with the expression that w is equal to the square root. v squared minus u squared is equal to epsilon relative u cotangent of u. Okay, so very different type of equation. We have the cotangent instead of the tangent. Now, as u goes to zero, epsilon relative u cotangent of u goes to epsilon relative because u cotangent of u uh, goes to one. As u goes to pi over two, epsilon relative u 
or tangent of u goes to zero. Okay, so we can conclude that if, if v is less than or equal to one, and epsilon relative is greater than one, there is no solution. Because what you're going to have is here's pi over 2, and here's v less than or equal to 1. Of course, pi over 2 is greater than 1. And we have this function, uh, w is the square root of v squared minus u squared. And that's never bigger than 1, either on the u-axis or the w-axis here. And then we have the other function, in this case, which is epsilon relative u cotangent to u, and that starts out at epsilon relative, which is greater than 1, so it's greater than v, and it goes down to 0 at pi over 2, so that they do not intersect. And so we can see that the, the lowest frequency solution is going to be the TMZ solution if we're down with v less than 1, that's the only solution we can have. So here's what that looks like for the case of uh, v is equal to 1, epsilon relative is 1.01. So we have here the, the, uh, the blue curve is the f of u, which is square root of v squared minus u squared. The red dashed curve is the g of uh, u, which is 1 over epsilon relative u tangent of u, and those those were guaranteed there's a intersection we've already talked about. But then here's what we'll call h of u is epsilon relative u cotangent of u, that's the dashed dotted green line, and that does not intersect with the blue line, the f of u. So there is a solution for f of u is equal to g of u, and that is the TMZ mode, but there's no solution for f of u is equal to h of u, which is what we would need for the TEZ mode. Now, if we increase the value of v, we can, we can get it large enough that there is a solution for the TEZ modes, where f of u is equal to h of u, and also we'll have solution, solutions, more than one solution, in fact, for f of u is equal to g of u. We can see that up here. Here we've plotted this out. Where we, here's u is equal to 1. So if, if we have v is equal to 1, we would get a single solution here. But if we have v is much bigger, in this case, about 4.6, uh, 4 we can actually get two solutions, two different modes, different values of u, which are going to mean that there are going to be different values of the beta y. They're going to be bigger value of beta y. So there are going to be more oscillations of the sine function inside the dielectric for these higher order modes. But if we limit ourselves to a v less than 1, then we can only get a single solution for the TMZ case, no solutions for the TEZ case. And then we have a single mode operation.